Good morning. Certainly would like to welcome each of you here to our services at First Baptist Church. And for those of you that are joining us from home, we welcome you as well. As we look out into the uh, congregation here this morning, even though we might be sparse in numbers, we know this place is filled with the Spirit. And it is for that reason we come. We come as brothers and sisters in Christ, joining together and raising up our Lord and Savior. So now let us come, setting aside all things, as we join together as one in this hour of worship. Let us come. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 95 and John 4. Will you please join me? O come, let us worship and bow down. The hour is coming and is now here. Holy One, for every pilgrim searching for a home, for every child searching for a family, for every weary soul longing for rest and hurting heart aching for healing, for every person who seeks a moral challenge, more meaning and a deeper kind of life than merely existing, for all of us, may this be a place of healing and homecoming. In this hour, may the seekers be found by you, for you, O oh God, are our life and our hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you now to stand as we sing hymn 241, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. Please stand.
seated. I'd like to invite our children to come down for our children's time. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. Okay. So today we're going to imagine. Okay. Do you have an imagination? Yeah. I think both of y'all have pretty good imaginations. Yeah. That's great. But sometimes we adults don't imagine too well. So anyway, well, let's, let's imagine together. So, okay. I want you to close your eyes. All right, everybody, everybody else, y'all close your eyes too. Don't take a nap. Just everybody close your eyes. All right. I want you to imagine with me that it is July. And it is very, very hot outside. It's the kind of day when you walk outside and the heat hits you in the face like a brick wall when you walk outside. It's so hot that you have a hard time catching your breath. So you've been outside, you've been running and playing, and you're just burning up. And you're all sweaty and stinky. And your mouth is so dry, it feels like cotton. You're so thirsty, and then you look up ahead, and you see glasses of cool water and a gigantic swimming pool, and the water is shimmering. It looks so inviting. Okay, you can open your eyes. Okay, so now what do you do? What are you going to do? Jump in the water. Jump in the water, yeah. What are you going to do? You going to jump in the water, too? Yeah, and how about this glass of water? Are you going to take a big old... I'm going to take a big step and jug it and chug it. Chug it. Okay, I like that. That's right, yes. Yeah, chug it down. All right. Well, the story today, the Bible story, is about Jesus being really hot. It's a really hot day, and it's noontime, and he's thirsty. He needs some water to drink. So he goes up to a well... And, you know, back then, they didn't have running water in your house. You know that? You didn't have, you know, a, a faucet you could turn on or a shower. If you wanted water, you had to go to a well and get the water out of a well. So he goes up to a well, and he's, he's sitting there, and a woman comes up to get some water. And he starts talking to her about water. But then he starts talking about living water which is really confusing. Yeah, what is living water? It's not water that you can drink, but it's water that gives us life. Basically, what Jesus is talking about is that God's love is like water. We need it to survive. We need God's love. So God's care for us is essential for our lives. And just as we need water to live, we also need God. So the living water is God's love for us. So I encourage you the next time you get thirsty and have a big glass of water or when it's July and you go swimming, I want you to remember that God gives us living water, that God loves us and cares for us very much. Okay? All right, will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us water and living water. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Good morning. I am going to be reading from Psalms 95 this morning. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with songs. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today you will hear his voice. 
Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of our trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This is the word of God for the people of God. During this season of Lent is a time when we reflect upon our lives and take the opportunity to take stock of what we have done and what we have left undone. So I invite you to now join me in the unison prayer of confession. Lord, you know who we are. You know everything that we have done. We thirst for things that will never satisfy us. We commit ourselves to things that will never last. We worship things that will never bring salvation. Still, you offer us the gift of living water. Still, you offer us the gift of eternal life. Forgive us, O Lord, and give us this living water so that we may never thirst again. Amen. My friends, this is the good news of God's grace. Though we were sinners, Christ died for us. Though we were enemies of God, God loved us. Once we were lost and dead, now Christ has become our life and our salvation. Thanks be to God. Will you please pray with me? Spirit of God, you are the source of our renewal, our rebirth, and our recreation. So it is with the faith in that that we now speak aloud those who are on our hearts and in our minds. Lord, hear our prayers. 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 Holy One, you focus on what is most broken, all that looks like it is beyond repair. With the breadth of rede redemption, you take the tiniest shards of hope and restore them to more than they once were. You do not shy away from the horrific valley the stormy mountains, or the dry plains, but move in where others fear to tread. You came into the world as a God with skin on, who knows the things for which we thirst and those that make us rise up and dance. You instill us with breath, apart from which there can be no life. Help us to realize that we are mere mortals and all the wind we can huff and puff into our most desperate situations is not enough until we breathe as one with you. Now breathe the wind of your spirit through the soul of our church until the doors rattle and the foundations shake with the movement of your power and we know again that you are the living God. Make us vulnerable to the needs of a broken world Call us from nothingness to wholeness, from death to life. Let us listen for your call to rise up and live. Spirit of God, we wait breathlessly for you. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to stand as we sing hymn 597, He Keeps Me Singing. Please stand.
This is from John, uh, I can't read it, John 4, 5 through 42, the woman at the well. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, we will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were, ur the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do not you say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, 
one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I had ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the Lord's reading for us this day. Thanks be to God. I'd like to welcome these folks who are worshiping with us from across the United States this morning. Michelle Medlin says good morning from Kansas. She says it's almost spring there. Mike and Sandy Fennerfrock are with us this morning. Mike and Diane Goodwin from Florida. Carl Ponstingle says good morning from the Roanoke Valley. Carol Grove says greetings from Pennsylvania. It's 28 degrees here and the daffodils are blooming. Sarah Clemens says good morning also. Will you, will you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the name of our sermon this day is, well, actually... So our good friends in South Carolina have a son that's about the same age as Reed, and I have changed his name to Fred to protect the innocent. Well, Fred is a very smart young man, and he always did well in school. That is, when he paid attention. You know how those desks have those little cubbies in front, you know, that have the separate seats, the little cubbies? Well, our friend Fred, countless times, would be reading a book during class, and he would stick it in that little cubby and read it when the teacher wasn't paying attention. Ever since Fred was a tiny little tot, if you would ask him one question, you had to be prepared for a very long answer. And as he grew older, his answers to your questions became long tales. And if he usually started his tale with, well, actually, if you said something like, well, that was a great basketball game that you played in, he would say, well, actually, and then he would proceed with his tale. Or if you would say, I heard that your Christmas vacation was wonderful, he would say, well, actually, and then he would continue with his story. And you knew you were going to be there for quite a while. Well, Jesus was passing through Samaritan territory when he decided to take a break by the well. He was tired from his journey and was feeling very thirsty. And it was the noon hour. The sun would have no doubt been very hot. No sooner had he settled down to rest then a Samaritan woman showed up to fetch water. As those who have lived under such circumstances know, one does not usually fetch water at noontime. This is a task for early in the morning. I remember my trips to Haiti right after the big earthquake in 2010. The Baptist church and school in Grand Guave had a well and while we were outside eating our breakfast under the mango tree, children and women were lined up to load up their containers with water for the day. They did it early in the morning before it got so hot. Getting water from a well is a task for very early in the morning or maybe late in the evening. 
when the temperature is more hospitable, before the heat gets too unbearable. So why on earth was there a woman at the well at this time of the day? And why was she all alone? Tradition suggests that noon was the hour when persons who were socially ostracized or ashamed would go to the well, so they wouldn't have to face the harsh and cold treatment of other women and others in the community. Jesus did something most unusual for his time and day, but not unusual for him. He ventured beyond the boundaries of the religious and cultural taboos of his day and began a conversation with the woman. In the first place, Jewish rabbis were not supposed to interact with a Samaritan at all. You don't talk to Samaritans. But Jesus broke with that convention and tradition. And this conversation with Jesus allowed the woman at the well to redefine herself and her mission that day, therefore cha changing the course of her life. Now, last week, our sermon was on Nicodemus and his late night meeting with Jesus, his late night conversation. This story today, the conversation of the woman at the well with Jesus, is in many ways opposite of the story of Nicodemus and his conversation with Jesus. The woman in our story does not seek Jesus out. Instead, he finds her at the well. However, Nicodemus does seek Jesus out. The encounter between Jesus and the woman does not happen under the cloak of darkness as Nicodemus meets Jesus at nighttime. No, the encounter between Jesus and the woman happens in the bright sun of the noonday hour. She's an uneducated woman, but she's a learner. Nicodemus, he's an educated man whom Jesus describes as a teacher. She's a Samaritan. He's a Jew. She has a questionable past, and he is a respected moral leader of the community. She has no name, but he is named. The Samaritan woman is a total outsider. She is a woman in a man's world. And she's a stranger to Judaism. She doesn't understand its practices, and she's confused about the geography of faith. She is outside the norms of conventional morality, and she is a stranger to the gospel. She is a religious, social, and political outsider. The contrast between these two conversations that these two characters have with Jesus is extraordinary. Because Nicodemus is unable to move beyond the confines of his religious system, while the Samaritan woman moves outside the, her religious expectations to engage Jesus in a theological debate. Nicodemus cannot hear that Jesus is sent by God whereas the woman actually hears the name of God. Nicodemus's last questioning words to Jesus expose his disbelief. How can these things be, he asked. Whereas the last words of the woman at the well were, he cannot be the Christ, can he? And these words lead her to witness to her whole town about who Jesus is. The woman came that day to draw water at noon, and she saw a man sitting there as she approached. She may have been wondering, is he going to speak to me? But I think she probably was wondering, probably was thinking, oh, great. I just wanted to get my water and go home. I'm really not in the mood for conversation today. You know, it's like when you go to Martin's and all you want to get is some bread and then you run into 10 different people that you know, and you have to talk to all 10 of them. Then you come back out, and you spend an hour in the grocery store, and all you have is some bread. Or perhaps she wondered if Jesus would be rude to her or flirtatious, or would he just simply ignore her? 
coming closer to him, she can tell that he is a Jew. Jesus asked her for a drink of water, and the woman, perhaps surprised and taken aback, tries to put up a dividing wall between them because she had been victim of these walls in the past. She says, how is it that you, a Jew, can ask me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus did not follow along with her line that she pursued. Instead, he decided to not push her away as others had. He wanted to have a relationship with her. Perhaps he saw within her her potential, her possibility, her talent, and her goodness. Jesus countered with an offer, an olive branch. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and, and he would have given you living water. Suddenly, their conversation went from casual, shallow conversation about water to deep conversation about living water. While they are both talking about water, they are speaking from different points of reference with different viewpoints on water. Then the conversation moves to something on a much more personal level. Jesus tells her, go, call your husband and come back. And I hear her responding, well, actually, I don't have a husband. Why did Jesus ask her to go and call her husband? The unfortunate result of this moment in the story has been centuries of preaching that dismisses her as a loose woman, maybe even a prostitute. While many Bible readers down through the years have been preoccupied with the woman's sin, our passage, if you read it closely, does not say anything about sin, nor does it say anything about Jesus forgiving her. Jesus' question to her about her husband is not a comment on her marital status over which she would have had no control. Y'all remember, women were property back then. Rather, like Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus' words are meant to move her to the next level of understanding of who Jesus is. I think we miss the point when we try to chase down the implications of her marital history. The point is that Jesus knew her. Jesus said right back to her, well, actually, you were right in saying that you have no husband. Jesus knew her story. He knew her history. And he loved her. There may be things that we all wish we could hide from God. Pieces of our stories that we hope we will not have to confess. The good news for all of us is that God knows us and has work for all of us. No matter who we are or where we have been or what has happened in our lives. If Jesus appeared at noon today, sitting out at the town gazebo or at the picnic table right outside our church office or maybe at the pub down the street, Jesus would actually know us. He would know you just as he knew the Samaritan woman. When the woman comes to the startling recognition that she has been talking to the Messiah, she leaves her bucket. She runs to the village with news. Come and see the man who has told me everything that I have ever done. And Jesus loved her anyway. She does not say that, but that is implicit in her action and the joy with which she runs and with which she proclaims that he is the Messiah. Everything she ever did is a list of sins, and we all have a long list of sins, but it's also a list of all the good things that she ever did too. Jesus knows all of us and still loves us and forgives us. 
in that moment, she sees God. She recognizes Christ. And she leaps up to tell others. I can hear her telling people as they start questioning her encounter with a Jesus, with the Jewish rabbi Jesus. Well, actually, and she fills them in on the secret to living water and that the Messiah has come. And many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. She has gone from being the loner, the outcast, the pariah, the noon water fetching married five times woman. She has gone from that to being a preacher, telling others the good news. Will Williman tells this story. A woman attended his church regularly when her family vacationed at the coast. She said that she had begun attending his church because it was the only church on the beach where a black person could feel welcomed. And this pleased Dr. Williman. She had a difficult life and experienced firsthand oppression, tragedy, and hate. One summer when she arrived with her family and when Dr. Williman visited with her, she told him that the previous year had been really difficult. Her beloved husband of many years had died a terrible and painful death. Her only son had been incarcerated after a questionable banking deal gone bad. And now she had taken in her two little grandchildren as her sole responsibility, even though she was getting on in years. As they visited together, Dr. Williman felt this overwhelming sense of futility. What becomes of her now? How can she overcome these difficulties? Yet she, expressing faith, born no doubt out of years of struggle and pain, said to him, Well, actually, I know God will make a way for us. I found that when I've reached out, he'll be there. Not always when I wanted him to be, but always when I absolutely needed him. He doesn't always come on time, but he always shows up. I'll make it with his help. Yes, I will. Without thinking, Williman exclaimed, This isn't reality, is it? You've got these two little children, huge financial problems, and your health isn't great. After all you've been through, get real. Williman said it was his learned Tisk, tisk, old lady, you've got to face the facts and be realistic. And then he confesses, but how did I know? How could I be so sure that that woman's calm, confident trust, trust affirmed in so many, in so many places in Scripture, was stupidity? Well, actually, maybe she was right. Maybe God's life-giving abilities, God's life-giving water isn't contained in our little boxes. Maybe she is right. Maybe there is a presence, God's presence, that is something greater than we all can imagine. This Messiah comes in a form that we do not expect. And he knows us. He knows us inside and out. Jesus appeared to the woman at the well and beyond her wildest dreams and imaginations, he offered her living water. He said to the craziness of her past and her current situation, well, actually, I love you. I know you. And you are mine. Well, actually, he's saying that to each of us, too. May it be so in our lives. Amen. So, my friends, I invite you at, in this time of silent reflection to think about what, what's going on in your life. So take just a few moments now to talk with God about what's going on in your life.
ever-present God, you know our past and you know our present situations. Thank you for giving us living water and for loving us through it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our response hymn today is hymn number 479, Come Ye Sinners Poor and Needy. And I'll be down front. If anyone would like to, to come and make a decision to follow Christ or to learn more about our church, I would love to share that with you. So I invite you as you sing hymn number 471 to continue to reflect with God on your life and how much God loves you. Let's stand and sing together.
Let us pray. Almighty God, thank you for the gift and giver of life. Thank you for this beautiful day that only your hands could have made. Let us truly rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Please be seated for just a moment. I want to read you a thank you letter that we received in the church office. And this is from Steve and Patty McIntyre Frazee. And the, Patty is Susan McIntyre's granddaughter. So I want to read this letter. She says, brothers and sisters in Christ, words cannot express our gratitude for every prayer spoken for our family in the past and present. Your prayers were felt during Elisa's pregnancy, Alyssa's pregnancy and delivery of Cooper. I truly thought we would make it down by now. His great-grandmother Susan really needs to meet him. For everyone's health, we have, we have not been able to make it. Cooper is so happy and has his great-grandma Susan's and his mommy's smile. He is such a blessing, and so are each and every one of your prayers. In him, Steve and Patty. Patty's your daughter. Sorry. So, so thank you very much, Patty, for sending this thank you note. And thank you all for your prayers. Prayers really do make a difference. So let us continue to lift each other up in prayer. I also want to remind you about Friday night's game night here in the Fellowship Hall on St. Patty's Day. Um, we're going to have lots of children, I'm sure, here on Friday night. So if you'd like to come out and, and um, have lots and lots of fun playing games and eat some pizza, we'd love to have you. So Friday night... Uh, around start be here about 5 30 is that right kids will start getting here about six six okay so um please no, no you don't want the children here earlier no okay if you're an adult be here before six if you're a child come at six how's that so we'll have a lot of fun friday night i hope that you'll you'll come join us also make make sure you've made note of the other announcements in the worship guide Probably the newest one is that we are going to have a spring cleanup day on April the 15th, which is a Saturday from 9 to 12. We've got lots of projects, and so we'd love to have you come help us on that day um, as we spruce up our buildings and also the outside of our, our sanctuary and our education building. Will you please stand now for a benediction? My friends, war, illness, strife, hardship, and loneliness are all part of our world and our lives, and it's enough to get us down. But Jesus has come along beside us and said, well, actually, you are not alone. You are mine, and you are loved. So let us go from this place with that good news resounding and reverberating in our hearts. Go now to love and to serve. Amen.